sauce truth is when you recognize that you have some original ingredients, you have something out of the bottle. These are the, the techniques that you have learned through your programs, through your credentials, your certifications, your degrees. All of those are valuable things and basis for the, the, the work that we do. And you must go and add some other elements to it. And so as I'm describing this to Krishana, she was like, uh-huh, we're gonna call that sauce truth. And poof, we created something that was very, very portable, very easy to understand. Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I am the host of today's episode, Heather Shea. Today on the podcast, I am thrilled to be joined by Marcus Moore and Krishana Robertson to discuss a counter strategy to out of the box DEI work, or as Krishana and Marcus call it, how to not. You might be wondering if you saw the title of the episode, not what? Well, we're going to unpack that today in today's episode. Um, I got a taste of this concept at an incredible extended program session at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity, NCORE, in early June in New Orleans, and I knew like immediately I had to find a way to extend this conversation to an episode um, on our podcast. So before I bring in our guest today, let me tell you a little bit about our channel if you're new to Student Affairs Now. Student Affairs Now is a premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by Simplicity. A true partner, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life with technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast for more information about our sponsor. As I mentioned, I'm the host of today's episode, Heather Shea. My pronouns are she, her, and her, and I am broadcasting from the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples otherwise known as East Lansing, Michigan, home of Michigan State University, where I work. As I mentioned earlier, I had the opportunity to engage in an experience at NCOR, not a program, an experience in June in this session called How to Not. And so I am so excited. Let me bring in our two panelists um, to introduce you to Marcus and Krishana. Thank you both so much for joining me for the episode. Um, but we're going to just start with just kind of a bit about your background and how you're coming into this conversation today. Um, and I'm going to start with Krishana. Thank you so very much, Heather. Excited to be here. And thank you for wanting to learn how to not. I dig it. Well, my name is Krishana Roberson. I use she and her pronouns, and I am an award winning racial strategist and the founder of Collaborate Consulting. Collaborate, which means working and learning collaboratively to elevate yourself and others, is a global organization that where we focus in on D E I and B, um, mm -hmm. what most folks know as know as diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I am a black woman, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I currently reside in Marietta, Georgia, because no one really lives in Atlanta. So even though they say Atlanta, that's really not what it is. <laughs> uh, I love this work of DE&I. It is who I am. It is through my soul, my nervous system. I love it, as well as long walks on the beach, talking about co-conspiring against racism while sipping on an ice white chocolate mocha. Uh, but I've been doing this work for about 20 years now, and it gives me great joy and pleasure when I get to partner with awesome folks like Marcus who do this work in connection and in collaboration with me. Marcus, thank you so much. Krishana, so, so great to you. And I'm sorry, I mispronounced your last name in the intro, Roberson. I will make sure and correct that. Um, Marcus, welcome. Uh, tell us a little hey. bit about you. Well, 44 years ago, my mama started calling me Marcus, and that's the way it's been ever since. I was born in Germany to a Black father. We moved to the United States at a very young age, and so that's where I developed this accent. I live in the ancestral homelands of the Creek, the Chattahoochee and the Muskogee, in a place that is 
today known as Columbus, Georgia, that is adjacent to Fort Moore, which I was thrilled when I found about the rename, used to be Fort Benning, who was a Confederate general. And we don't like honoring people who killed U.S. soldiers for the cause of slavery. So we changed that just a little while ago. Fort Moore is around the corner from where I live. I've been doing this sort of racial equity work in some form or fashion for a long, long time. I've been doing it professionally for about 10 years now. And in that capacity, I coach leaders, executives, administrators of all stripes in order to advance their work towards racial equity. My outfit is called Nia Palmares. That is the, the agency that I own and operate. And in that place, we take a very creative approach to our work. And I think it's that creativity that caught your eye as we were doing this work. Yeah, I I can't even describe the session. So I'm going to not even attempt to. Uh, you all created it. Um, and so I would love to hear, Krishana, you tell us a little bit about what you meant, what you mean by how to not, and what, what led you to both collaborate um, with Marcus, but also like thinking about this work, um, bringing this to the world? Oh, yes. How to not. Well, I think about it in the lens of when folks decide to do this work of DEI, it is this continual evolution because the work is personal first, right? We all evolve from when we first started in doing this work remembering, oh, that was a great idea, or, oh, that was just terrible. Uh, never do that again. So being able to understand how to not, so that way we can figure out how to. Mm. And when we think about how to not, it is this, as I mentioned before, it's you have to be, be willing to co-conspire because if you conspire holding on to who you are as a person, allowing your creativity to just burst like a bubble out while conspiring against organizations that tell us, well, you got to do it this way. You have to stay within compliance. Doing DEI work is a very different path. And much of you is personal. So you got to be able to feel empowered to be you and who you are and all the various intersectionality that shows up um, and be empowered to move and make different decisions because folks aren't going to get equitized after uh, within a timeline. Things aren't going to get fixed when we say, oh, well, we're going to do this strategy that is for 10 days. None of that works within this work because it's driven by beliefs. So when we talk about how to not, it's about seeing the beauty and the balance in who you are, understanding that rest and being angry is okay. Now, how do we liberate ourselves through that by doing different things? And when, particularly with Marcus and I, um, we've seen this work through so many different levels um, across K through 12 systems, across higher ed systems, across uh, advertising agencies, across governments, it shows up in different places. And depending on where you are within a particular industry, you got to understand how to not a little bit differently. So when Marcus and I were kind of talking through, oh, well, what are we going to do? It's Encore. We got to do something. Um, we really started digging into how we do the work in a way that allows us to be who we are, but also allows us to bump up against the systems that sometimes prohibit us from getting in and blowing it all up. Um, I often like to say, um, don't allow yourself to turn into somebody who wants to rip their face off, rip somebody's face off their face, because then the work won't happen. Um, and how to not is a way to be able to look at the beauty of the challenges, the beauty of creativity, and the beauty of who we each individually are in order to understand there's another way to do this. Wow. Marcus, what would you add? And if you have a specific example or experience that motivated you to join this conversation, I'd love to hear about that too. 
for sure. So it's the way Krishana named that we come through this work initially from a personal level rather than a professional level, hmm. right? And so as marginalized people of color, particularly in spaces of higher ed, we found ourselves more and more marginalized the more successful we were and the higher level of, of degree we were trying to achieve, right? In that space, we recognize higher ed is exists as a way of developing stability and conformity to particular standards. And these standards have been successful in many times in many places in many ways. However, not for everyone. And so what we're looking at are different ways of being in those spaces as students, as administrators, and as consultants. We exist as transformational entities in places that live for stability. So let me offer this piece of bait for, for the listeners in, in this space. If you are doing DEI work and you've done it for a year, six months, uh, a relatively short term with an organization, you may come to the point, as both Krishana and I have, where the powers that be will say, we've been doing this work for six months, a year, two years, and we've invested this many tens of thousands of dollars. Where are our measurable results? Now, what we are not allowed to say out loud, but very much fills our thought bubble is, now how many millions of dollars have you spent over decades and decades, some institutions for centuries, developing situations that were in need of racial equity, in need of gender equity, in need of ability equity, in need of an ability to recognize the plurality of who we are and what we bring to the table. You have invested so much in creating systems that marginalize us and so little in places that, that accept us for who and how we are. And so with that little, with what we already know, the wisdom that we had before we showed up on your campus, how do we utilize that to transform our experiences and our spaces? How do we save our lives with that? Krishana and I both live in the state of Georgia, and just a little while ago, the, the Senate race that, that had a lot of people's attention pitted a man who can barely pronounce his name, is frequently dishonest, disingenuous, and let's just say less than consistent, versus the pastor, the pastor of MLK 1 and 2's church. And here in the Bible Belt, it, it, was, it was a frog's hair that separated them at the ballot box. And we wondered, where is the meritocracy that we were supposed to subscribe mm -hmm. to? Where are the rules that we are supposed to follow? How, how does this, this setup tell us to do right, be right, act right, and then get the rewards? So obviously, yeah, sometimes that works, and sometimes it just does not. How do we show up in a way that is self-preserving? Because this sort of foolishness can drive you nuts. And in fact, it almost did for me. I had to take a sabbatical, get out of the country for a little while and, and, and step away. And that's where the, the language of how to not was born. That, that was a particularly powerful part of your session when you brought up all the slides and pictures and, and rotating through. It was, it was a moment. And I'll, I'm going to describe this method here in a little bit more detail because I think one of the things that really struck me about your session, you know, when you when you arrive at a conference, you get this massive program book and Encores is hefty and you're flipping through to try to decide how how am I going to spend this block of time? Um, and your session happened to be an extended three hour session on a Saturday morning starting at eight o'clock or eight thirty or something. Yikes. And it was a early it was a and you were in New Orleans, right? So I was like, oh, my gosh. People who are coming to this session are committed and excited. And I was absolutely blown away with the way you all framed and engaged us as an audience. Um, so I'm really, I'm curious about that because you, you talked about this story about the Senate race um, and you did it though through this really embodied mixed media, interdisciplinary, there were a lot of interactive components that you brought in um, it was like no session I ever have been to at Encore um, or any conference, frankly. And so I'm curious about like, you all are drawing from, you know, many different bodies of knowledge and, and knowledges. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 
talk a bit about how you can, you know, conceived of and crafted that space, um, you know, and, and what you kind of are also disrupting by putting out a session at this very, you know, academic conference that really pushed, pushed back at some of those conference like conventions. When Prashana and I first met, I asked her, how many blocks away from the dead ass center of Brooklyn were you born and raised? <laughs> and I think she said four. And I was like, yeah, I believe that, which is particularly valuable. We are celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Mm -hmm. That means so much to both of our lives. And the way that I've talked about how we bring our wisdom, our, our pre-collegiate wisdom to college. When I do seminars, um, for the longest time, we end up in this place, and perhaps you've been there, where the, the, the small groups are talking amongst one another, and the MC needs to bring the whole room back together. And I've been in those spaces where the, the person in charge says, if you can hear me clap once, if you can hear me clap twice, and I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm a grown-ass man. I ain't doing that. This is for preschoolers. We need something different. <laughs> so I developed this technique, and I remember very vividly that while Krishana was in the audience of a group that I was facilitating, I use music as a cue to bring the group back together. So when you hear this song come on, you don't have to stop like it's red light, green light, but you got to wrap it up. Krishana is very serious. She is sincerious about her work. She was deeply engaged with whatever partner she was collaborating with at the time. And she's saying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I hit the, the beat for one of Biggie's classic. And with that, da -na 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 -na, I remember she threw her head back, arms up, and it was right back in the party like it was 1997 all over again, right? <laughs> the engagement that, that we bring to the space is essential for people's experience. It lets them know that they're seen, that they're heard, that the, the references that we're using to explain the thing really connect with who and how they are. And that brings not only an element of, of entertainment and verve to them, but an element of joy and authenticity for us. That was one of the, the platforms that we wanted to bring to the space where we teach. I love and it. And we Krishan also Miles. know that in my in previous bodies, I've been a coach to K through 12 teachers. I've mm -hmm. been faculty at higher ed, right? And I think about when, in the words of Drake, started from the bottom, now we're here. I think about when it started and all of the things that I screwed up on to, because of how we're taught. We're taught as educators that we have to be, act, speak a certain kind of way. And a big piece of that is removing who we are, right? Remove emotion, remove sharing bits and pieces of who you are, remove mistakes, pretend to be, per, pretend that perfection exists. And as I evolved, it was important to look at, I want to be in a space into which I can see, feel, and hear myself. And part of that is not with a lecture. A part of that is <laughs> not with, um, someone just theorizing everything. Show me how this works for you. Show me how this failed. Show me how you failed forward. Show me that my, the, that my cultural aspects are just as important. Biggie is just as important as Mozart, right? Dr. Maya Angelou is just as important as Steinbeck. And being able to see over time that it's okay to just bust open the box and be who you are, it's always so thoroughly important. And this has been the norm for Marcus and I. Oh, y'all not just gonna sit here and we're gonna be talking to you. You're gonna get all Marcus and I also love to use the term sauce. You're gonna get all the sauce, right? However, that sauce needs to be fit. If you real spicy and you need it at that level or you real mild, we're gonna give it to you all the way for you to be able to connect. That is the most important thing. Be able to connect to what we're saying. Pick up pieces and use it in the ways that you see fit. Mm -hmm. Go go deeper on that concept of sauce a little bit because that was a mo that was one moment of many that I was like, this session 
is feeding everything about what I'm, what I'm kind of needing at this moment. So what do you mean by sauce? Well, Krishana came up with this term, uh, sauce truth, after, after we were having a conversation about how we bring our, I'll keep the language consistent for ease, our, our pre-collegiate wisdom mm -hmm. to the campus, right? We know that in our culture, whatever grocery store you go to, whatever farmer's market, whatever it is, if you go buy a bottle of sauce, particularly barbecue sauce, and you put that naked sauce on whatever chicken, pork, beef, tofu you got on the grill, that's unacceptable. Because we know by law that barbecue sauce is an ingredient in barbecue sauce. You go get barbecue <laughs> sauce and add to it your cayenne, your black pepper, your beer, your whatever it is to make it your sauce, right? It is the way back to hip hop. We can all take the same Clark Wallabies and put different laces on them, tie them up different ways, mix and match the colors. We can do all sorts of different things with the, the ingredients we have been given. Collage mm. is an element of Black history and Black culture from the beginning to now till tomorrow, right? You take pieces that already exist and you make something new and original out of them. We are hip hop and that is hip hop. So sauce truth is when you recognize that you have some original ingredients, you have something out of the bottle. These are the, the techniques that you have learned through your programs, through your credentials, your certifications, your degrees. All of those are valuable things and basis for the, the, the work that we do. And you must go and add some other elements to it. And so as I'm describing this to Krishana, she's like, uh-huh, we're going to call that sauce truth. And poof, we created something that was very, very portable, very easy to understand. And then we made a little sidebar inside the seminar. Like before we get into the concepts and the theories, how about y'all trade some of your recipes? Like what, what do you put in your barbecue sauce? Your, your egg roll dip, your, your French fry magic, what, what, what happens? And I, I learned some tricks in New Orleans that I'm using in my kitchen today. So I'm glad for all that. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally wrote down some of those ideas. And I, I mean, I think this is the idea. It's like this out of the box, right? The what's in the jar um, is an ingredient in, but like we have to bring ourselves to that, right? We have to show up who we are with our lenses. Um, and that ends up having an effect on kind of what the end product is. And it's going to be customized for each individual who's a part of the but I, I love that idea of sauce truth because it it absolutely, um, you know, and particularly in DI work, like there's a lot of stuff that's been done over and over and over, you know, some of that is okay to still use. Maybe some of it is like, we're no longer ever going to take that bottle out of the fridge again. But I think, um, you know, the ability for those of us who kind of come into this work as creatives to to adapt and then change and build upon. I think that's kind of what I what I took away. We also recognize that as a limiting trap. Mm -hmm. So within conversations in DEI, there's a lot of, of gravity and mag magnetism around what are known as best practices. Mm -hmm. What did you see happening at XYZ campus that we can now do at our campus? The cold reality is that no campus has developed full-on racial equity. And so at best, what you're doing is copying an ineffective strategy in the name of progress. Perhaps that strategy is less ineffective than the one you currently have, but it's not the gold medal winning standard, right? Because racial equity, gendered equity, lived equity is not a thing that we have achieved anywhere. So to copy what has already been done is mimicry of mediocrity. Mm -hmm. What we'd rather do is use that as inspiration, say, all right, so here are some elements of it that we saw as, as productive and valuable. But when we add to, to what exists, then we can make something better, right? We experiment moving forward. It's, it's sauce, truth, and policy. DEI work is rolled, dipped, and fried in risk. You cannot be willing to be in constant discomfort and be in and, and the decision making not be full of risk if you want to do something that's different. It's easy to 
put a technical solution if you're developing a checklist and saying, this is what we're going to do here. So we did that check. Oh, we did that check. Oh, we hired this black woman check. Oh, we hired this gay male check. Now, that's the extent of the DEI work that your particular organization wants to do. No worries. But if you're really looking to create systemic change, if you're really looking to challenge and push and pull people, you have to be willing to say, you know what, this is a risk. It may work, it may not, but you got to be willing to try it. Mm. And you got to be willing to be in this space. How to not is also uh, a praise to the physicality of it's always uncomfortable. I'm always in a space, how to not, okay, how do I go about doing this? And how do I sit within that? And, and it's always that. And it, it doesn't stop. Like I said earlier, you're not going to get to an end game because did racism in? I don't think so. Uh, nope. <laughs> nope. I, I don't see it happening mm -hmm. um, anytime soon. I am seeing many, many more walls being built in which to contain it and allowing it to thrive. Yeah. Yeah, I think I I really appreciate that um, that piece because I do think on college and university campuses, the check boxes and the lists and the, you know, we have to fulfill some compliance mandate. Um, we're gonna have this required DEI training and then people say, okay, I did my two hours, I'm done, you know, well, till next year when it's due again, right? But like this idea that we are all a part of a continuous learning community and learning moment. Um, the other thing that I think, you know, also resonates with me is uh, you said this as we were kind of getting ready to hit record around blowing it up, right? Like, are we, are we talking about blowing up kind of those conventions? And I, I've used this metaphor um, of the table for a while, right? Like we used to talk about diversity work as like, we just need to bring more voices to the table, more people to the table, you know? So we're going to add more chairs around this physically limited structure called the table. Um, okay, so now instead of a boardroom table, we're going to make it an equitable table. We're going to have a round table that we're going to you know, make it big enough so everybody can sit, everybody can see one another. So we're just going to change the shape of the structure, the, the, the table. Mm -hmm. What if the table didn't exist, right? Like what if we blow up the table? Um, so when you're talking about kind of the compliance center, it's like, okay, what do we do instead of that? You know, the, the conversation when I talk about this concept of the table is often, well, what are you going to put in place of it? Well, what we're talking about is a completely different remade system that doesn't have the same elements. Um, there aren't chairs sitting around a table. That's that's power. The table is power. So how can we dismantle some of that? Um, so when you were talking about blowing things up, I was like, oh, I'm going to unpack that a little bit a little bit more too. I think there's a certain attraction to the the spectacle mm. of blowing something up right that that in some ways in a very american way this embodies some sort of notion of of justice mm. we have destroyed the thing we have punished the thing that has punished us okay i mean if you if you're into the the van damme schwarzenegger approach to to solving problems then then that's one way of doing it how to not. I'm a student of the world's greatest academic discipline, anthropology. Mm -hmm. Shouts out to my mentor, Dr. Janetta B. Cole, and the way she introduced me to this work. And it helps me understand that in this construct of the table, very often there's an emphasis on the material and on the tangible ways in which mm -hmm. power is manifest, right? This shows up in org charts and hierarchies and department chairs and associate versus uh, assistant professors and all of that fun stuff that that, that causes HR to exist and, and do hard work. 
instead of this ever expansive hypothetical table growing with more and more perspectives, I would challenge that we find people who demonstrate the ability to grow. Mm. We want to grow people, not tables. That's, that, that's, that's a different business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so as part of our work, one of my specialties is in culturally relevant teaching. But then as I translate that to administrative spaces, a new, a new lens comes on called culturally relevant leadership. Very often there are administrators who operate in meetings or conferences in ways that we would never ever want for our young people to experience as a modality of learning, right? If teacher did unto student as principal does unto teacher, oh my gosh, what a horrible way that would be. What if we could show up with a new technique with multimedia and videos and sauce recipes and, and all these other things that engage and facilitate learning rather than present learning. So for these people around the table, Krishana and I have this, this method of facilitating new discoveries rather than listing answers that we need you to adopt. Mm. Right? Facilitation leads to a personal discovery which operates against this, uh, this, this dichotomy that we've constructed between compliance and creativity. We can force people through the use of power to comply, right? And we can create all sorts of campaigns to get people to comply and punish them and reward them and do all sorts of things. That takes a whole lot of work to do. We could also open up a space of creativity. In the leadership we talk about, there's a, a difference between being a leader and becoming a leader. Oftentimes we have this notion that people in charge are already endowed with the skills and abilities and the qualities, and they can just be, and they show up with the, the way that they are, and they, 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 they shine this, this virtue that we should all follow and be mesmerized by. I am startled. Like I said, it was 44 years ago that I got this name, and I am still growing up. I'm watching my mother still grow up. I thought there was this notion that eventually I would get to a particular point and I could have ice cream for breakfast and we're good to go and that's it, right? And it turns out as part of my growing up, I'm discovering, no, ice cream for breakfast is actually a bad idea <laughs> for reasons. <laughs> what if our leaders could become different, could become more equitable, and even the most equitable equity superhero that there is, I continually encounter obstacles and horizons in my understanding and in my doing. So I know there's space for the person 10 miles ahead of me to do the same. If we focus on a method of becoming rather than being, we don't have to worry about the construct of tables and chairs and rooms mm -hmm. and all those sorts of things. We get to be people we get to be ourselves and we get to be the best versions of ourselves. That's what we're pushing toward. Yeah. You know, if you're know, saying you that, Marcus, uh, I focus a lot on a uh, systemic DEIB strategy. And often the question that I, well, I have to remind people all the time, systems are made of people. Systems don't operate, right? Those systems are driven by our beliefs that allow us to have the same behaviors that we have that give us the same results we've had for the past some odd years. Because no matter where you go within our education system, the data is just as sexy in Brooklyn as it is in Michigan. It's the same. And when you talk about this way of becoming, I often have to remind people that this work, you have to be willing to sacrifice something and within that, could it sacrifice, could my sacrifice be what I am doing now in order to become, right? Can being able to make a decision that we say, I'm going to sacrifice my position in order for a different perspective and a different way of thinking to show up. And when folks think about becoming, and I love how Marcus um, explain that because it connects directly to what I talked about in the beginning. 
Marcus and I are on where we started. Our thinking, our approach, our ways of being. All of the failing forward that happened as a result <laughs> of where we are today, of oh, understanding Lord. the beauty of how to not. Mm -hmm. Right. It was ways in which we decided to become. Because we understand that we, the people, are the system we're trying to work up against. Mm -hmm. yeah, this idea. Long, mm, go ahead. I was going to say long before I was using uh, Black History by E40 in the seminars, which I think is one of my most creative creations. The first <laughs> song and I'll, I'm Krishan is going to learn something new about me. The first time I used a song in a seminar. It was MC Hammer's Let's Get It Started. And the people looked at me like, what, what have you brought into this space? And I was like, well, I tried. I, I tried something new. I'm going to choose a different song next time. All right, let's do some work. <laughs> There's room for all of us to grow. But I, I think what really resonates with this idea of becoming for me is that, you know, sometimes people in administrative leadership roles don't don't feel like whether it's in a a, a place from a, coming from a place of vulnerability, um, coming from a place of like I have to say do be all of the right right things, um, that I can't be in a process of becoming. I have to be I have to be perfect, right? And that that's based on white supremacy, right? But this idea that we are all becoming, you know, and working towards. And and able to admit when we don't when we don't know when we may have done something that we need to apologize for, and go back and repair harm right like that's a powerful moment as well, and that's that's the other part that kind of really resonated when you were talking about becoming. I'm like, what license do people have to be you know particularly at a certain level? You're like you've been given the you know you've been given the power. Can you still become, and how do we uh, release some of our administrative leaders from that? Like, you have to continually be perfect in these roles and know all the answers. I'm curious, as you go to campuses and work with folks or go into organizations, K-12 organizations, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm curious about your experience working with those types of leaders, right? Like that feel mm -hmm. like they have to have all the answers. Like, this isn't for me, this is for the staff, or this is for, you know, like where, where, how do you, how do you push against that? And then how do you facilitate that kind of next step that will maybe release some of that pressure? I, I always begin with a five minute chant of Practice makes permanent, not perfect. And we say that over and over again for five minutes. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, that's kind of, um, I, I do reiterate that. Mm -hmm. um, I equate a lot of things to food. And the reiteration that this work is so very different, but not outside of what you're already doing, right? That when we think about a deliciously made pulled pork barbecue sandwich with coleslaw on a buttered bun, one of my favorite things to eat, you take a bite, it's everywhere. It's up your nose, it's in your hair, it's mm -hmm. everywhere, but you keep eating it because it's so good. That's what this work is the toils that it takes for you to make that meat, which you start out being very tough, to become soft and succulent, to adding the various levels of sauce that you need to make it your own. And then you put it together, it's all gone, you start over. And consistently reiterating, especially to leaders, um, the messiness of this work and that it's okay to be rested messy, that it requires pieces of yourself that you had not accessed before. It requires levels of authenticity and vulnerability that you've never even thought of displaying. Um, has to be a big part of it. And um, the approach is very different, particularly when I go into K through 12, they expect, well, you're going to have your agenda and here's where we're going to, nope, 
I don't do none of that. We might start off with big lotto, big energy. That might be the feeling that we're walking into today. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so they're listening. Marcus is like twisting the top. The Mariah uh, wow. Carey version, the clean what? version with Mariah oh, Carey. Totally different. Totally different. <laughs> yeah. Um, so by establishing that even when you come into the space, what it feels like walking in is very different than what you're used to, allows for them to come, oh, it's a little bit different. The MC Hammer didn't threaten my contract. I know that. You show up with some lotto, and but that might be the last time you show up. So there you go. <laughs> I think in this space of of how do we get how do we get free to move from a space of being to becoming? Um, we think of the processes of socialization that have served our species the best for the longest, right? One of the particular challenges in higher ed is once people have a whole alphabet behind their name, they think they know everything. They have they have all the dues have been paid, and now it's time to to show up and be be the way you've been trained to be. And then might throw something new at you, like a pandemic or a pandemic or a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And in those ways, we're finding our how we have to discover new ways of being. One of the traps we run into in higher ed and everywhere else is in thinking that we have to solve this problem by ourselves. And so we can give away one of the one of the nuggets that we found so valuable in our in our work on how to not. We pointed to the patron Saint Audrey Lord, who many people know said, the master's tools cannot destruct the master's house. It right? will not destruct the master's house. And she's talking very specifically about the ways in which the, the techniques, the ideologies, the strategies that you learned in systems of sustainability cannot be used for the purposes of disruption. A lot of people are tuned into, into that quote and use it very often in our space. Less popular are the lines that surround that particular quote. Where Audrey Lord says, when we use community, we are able to find new ways of being. And community is the instrument of our survival. And so we have here we have a bunch of administrators, a bunch of leaders of department heads, and even professors who, who look at their, their courses and their syllabi as their own fiefdom to do unto as they please. It is a place that is allergic to community. And it's a place that needs community. So how can we find a place of belonging, of grace, of, of, of acceptance, of, of growth, of becoming by ourselves? None of us have been able to be socialized by ourselves. We all need a community in some form or fashion to become who and how we are. And that has led to our transformation. That same philosophy, that pre-collegiate wisdom shows up in how we do our work. Who in our community knows something about equity? Who in our community knows something about marginalized experience? Who in our community knows something about freedom? And how can we partner with these people? Not exploit them and use them for these two hours that we have them on campus mm. to check the box. But how can we be in community with them in a way that is reciprocal, in a way that is productive, in a way that is generative and moves toward justice? I think those are the types of things that that lead to our personal and institutional well-being. Just a thought. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think about um, the context in which we're we're doing this work, right? Sense and core in June. You know, we we have now state environments that are, you know, making doing anything called DEI work next to impossible. Um, the attacks on this actually as a as a functional area in student affairs and higher education is real. And mm -hmm. and, you know, there are colleagues of mine who are still in those states, you know, who, you know, they can't, you know, that you can't just say, oh, well, you got to move to a state where you, you know your work is valued. You can't, right? Like students still need to be served. Right. Um 
But I'd love to hear, you know, kind of your thoughts on this kind of increasingly perilous um, role that folks play and, you know, what kinds of messages of hope do you, do you try to instill if you're invited in and, and are able to share space with folks in those, in those contexts? Oh, I've got juicy thoughts. I got juicy thoughts. Today is Wednesday, August 14th, and we are residents of the state of Georgia, mm -hmm. where Rudy Giuliani has been indicted on RICO laws. Just, I, I, I know that's the headline that a lot of people yeah. are caught on to already, yeah. um, but I'm going I'm to allow the next five seconds just to savor the irony of Rudy Giuliani getting indicted on the RICO. I'll count to five. It makes me think of the ways that folks got to be careful what they ask for, right? Mm -hmm. Because here in Georgia, we got mandatory minimum sentences. You better be careful what you ask for. We are creating these systems that are ultimately, that can ultimately lead to the detriment of everybody. These anti-DEI mm -hmm. laws are all well and good as long as they mute conversations about this group, that group, and that group. But when it comes back on us group, somebody's going to be real sorry that they did that. Mm -hmm. We can recognize in many ways how, how these sorts of systems of limitation, of expression, of, of, of being are harmful personally, professionally, and dare I say, socially and nationally. Mm -hmm. All of that exists in an imaginary future that we can imagine. In the immediate term, we have the situation just like you named, where professionals who have been doing good work for a long time are now struggling to hold on to their livelihoods. And even greater than that, the work in this particular vein of justice is being cut off. All of this is traumatizing. And none of it is surprising to students of history. We know that for every movement toward justice, there's been a counter movement away. And so surprise, surprise, it's happened again and will happen again. But we also know the same way that our people have been able to, to come up with new ways of expression, new ways of survival, new ways of being, new ways of thriving in the face of foolishness. And we've been doing that for the last 400 years. We will do it again and we'll do it in community. If we subscribe to the patterns of what we are allowed to do, right? So, so consider this. In this conversation, we are both saying people in DEI are suffering in their DEI positions and then also grieving for the loss of DEI positions. How do those two positions make sense side by side? One at a time, yes, but together, like, I hate this DEI work. Oh, God, why are we losing this DEI work? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's something better of it something better available to us and something better available that young people have shown us that we can move around legendary institutions to achieve what we want to with much more ease than we could before. There are plenty of avenues toward justice and DEI and the ways that we have known it has been one. There are others and we're gonna find them, we're gonna make them and we're gonna propel them. And then watch what happens when all these systems come after Campus organizations like, I don't know, the Young Republicans for their lack of diversity and the, the particular ways that they are showing up in monoracial ways. Then what? We'll see. You know, Angela Rye said, all truth passes through three stages. First is ridicule. Second, it's violently opposed. And then third, it's accepted as being self-evident. Right. It's the cycle that continues to happen. And we look at that if we look at it through a timeline across generations. Right. When we look at the civil rights movement, when we look at the Black Lives Movement, when we look at um, marriage equality, who was in office, why the ebbs and flows in which things happen. We've been bitching and complaining about all of this for a long time. And there are moments in which great things happen, terrible things happen. 
Great things happen, terrible things happen. And it's all a result of the decisions that are made early on, right? That now, oh, wait a minute. I love what Marcus just said. Yeah, until the Republican gathering group on a campus is impacted negatively by all of these things, then we'll see a change into which that all goes back. Um, the climate, our politics, our communities are all the same. The only thing that makes it more heavy is technology because now we see it so much more now, which makes understanding how to not even more important because rest is a requirement of this work. And if you are constantly absorbing all of this, even the joys of Giuliani and the riverboat brawl, even those iterations of everything that pop up, it's still a lot, right? There are all these different things that happen where we're now seeing this beautiful eruption, particularly with the riverboat brawl, you see this beautiful eruption of people who are like, yes, we have created a counter narrative against the belief that we don't come together, that we're, we're not in things together, where particularly in a black community, yes, we are. This is, this is y'all just seeing it from this lens right now, um, to which now we see white cops with white chairs attached to their belt. And what does that mean to us? as a response. Mm -hmm. So it's constant, it is constant and it's not going anywhere. And to believe that one iteration of something is going to fix it will push us to not wanna do the work anymore. And we just can't do that. We gotta keep on keeping on. I couldn't think of a rap verse for that one, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, while you're, the... yeah, I, there's, there's definitely one there. Um, I think I think that's a good place actually for us to move to final thoughts because I love I I love how this conversation evolved. You know, in our prep, we were like, we can just go in a completely different direction. And I think we hit all the things. But if there's something that I missed that you really were hoping to indicate, I'd love for you to share that. Um as we always kind of end the podcast, uh, this is called Student Affairs Now. So we'd love to hear what you're pondering, thinking, troubling. Um, and if you would also be willing to share how people can connect with you, connect with your work, connect with your consultant work, um, and with the broader concept of how to not love to hear, um, that as well. Uh, who'd like to start with the final thoughts? I'll open it up as I didn't put assignments in. Krishana, you want to go about. first? So... I don't know if it's um, so much as a final thought, because like uh -huh. I said, this work is, is, is all encompassing, but it is important to know that one, for your listeners who are doing this work, you are not alone. Uh -huh. There are many co-conspirators that exist in, around, under, behind, in front of where you are. It is the, the idea that if you can minimize your ego to know that you don't have to do it alone, the door is going to always swing open. There's always somebody willing to do this work um, and for folks to stay in it. But more importantly, like Marcus and I want to help you do that. Mm -hmm. You are um, a rare breed of uh, a no limit equity soldier um, for anybody who decides to take this work on. Um, and because of that, we got to move to a different beat and a different grain. And we invite you to, to join us as we show you how to not. I um, am not a big social media person, even though my 26-year-old daughter tells me I should be. Um, but you can find uh, Collaborate Consulting on the web and very sporadic ways in which in, we post on Instagram. <laughs> um <laughs> Marcus is going to uh, kind of share all the details of how we are gladly collaborating to bring amazing things to folks, to build community, and um, 
to again build our coalition and our uh, no limit no limit equity soldiers as we co conspire toward racial equity. We'll we'll add a link to your website and anything um, that you'd like me to put in the show notes for for our listeners today. So we'll we'll help people find you. That's for sure. <laughs> Marcus, Ooh, what about you? Final final thoughts and. So I'm wondering as the the places that are titled DEI and the titles that are titled DEI come under particular scrutiny. We recognize that equity is everybody's job. If you're a dean, if you're a president, if you're a board member, if you're a department chair, if you're a professor, whatever role you have on the campus, equity isn't simply the job of those people in that office, right? And typically those are three people in the office for a 10,000 member campus. There's no way that we're gonna be able to accomplish that unless we all show up in new ways of becoming and being. To that end, we designed the how to not session that you saw Heather as part one of a five part series. And we're offering all five online and the links that are provided here on neopalmares.com and as well as this podcast You'll be able to find out how to subscribe for those and be a part of that community. The master tools aren't going to do it. Community will. We have a particular perspective and we're opening spaces for anybody who wants to know more or contribute more to that conversation to come and join us for these conversations. We promise it'll be worthwhile, a little bit entertaining, show you a different way of engaging the people around you that we're gonna model a brand of freedom that we wanna see on campus so that we can see ourselves in this work and we can see yourselves in this work too. So we hope that you click that link. We invite members across the campus to show up, students as well. If I, whoo, Krishana, if I knew then what I knew now, mm. oh my goodness. Well, some of y'all are at the damn point in, in the your back. life. <laughs> hey, mm. some of y'all are at the, the no then point in your lives. Come join us too. Yeah. Yeah. I, that is the, that is the key. If I had to add a final thought, it would be students inspire me and they are bringing that energy and engagement. And I agree with you, like in including them in the conversation, we have a coalition group on our campus that I think is really at, you know, like at the edge of creating and envisioning and you know from a futuristic perspective so we'll build we'll build that in as well as to get engaged students in this um i am so grateful for both of your time today uh thank you for your contribution thank you for the session at encore um firstly and then for joining me on the podcast um also want to send our heartfelt appreciation to our dedicated uh, producer, Nat Ambrosi, thank you for making us look and sound great. Uh, thanks also to the sponsor of today's podcast, Simplicity is the global leader in student services technology platforms with state-of-the-art technology that empowers institutions to make data-driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institution, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, but including not limited to career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success and accessibility services. So to learn more, you can go to simplicity.com or connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Please take a moment to visit our website and click on that sponsors link to learn more. And while you're there, if you're listening today and not already receiving our weekly newsletter, we send that out every Wednesday when we drop a new episode. Um, you can do that right there on the studentaffairsnow.com website. Um, and as, as we end every episode, I hope everybody has a fabulous week. It is August in higher ed. Um, thanks to our listeners. Thanks to both of you and make it a great week, everyone.